Thank you, Jillian, and thank you, Sark. And thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm Tim Barron, and I am the Law Help New York Program Manager with Pro Bono Net here in New York. And I have the deep, deep honor of moderating this panel with three remarkable guests who I'll introduce in a minute. You know, I think it was Helen Keller that said, alone, we can do so little, and together, we can do so much. And that's the focus of our presentation today. In particular, collaboration and partnerships between nonprofit organizations and for-profit companies. And if you'll indulge, indulge me with just another quick quote, quote. Um, and here's a quote from connecting attorneys to those most in need to creating legal tools to help individuals ad advocate for themselves. We make the law work for the many and not the few. And that's actually our mission here at Pro Bono Net, which, which is plastered all over our website. But how do we do it? We do it by fostering collaborations across business models from nonprofits to governments to academia, for-profits, consultants, hybrid models, and, you know, and so on. Uh, for instance, one of the, the many projects we're working on right now involves an elder justice organization, a bank, an evaluator consultant, and a software company. And potential collaborators, depending on the scope of this project eventually, could include also designers, web developers, copy editors, translators, and so on. And I, th I think a lot of you are familiar with the breadth and scope and depth of collaboration that we do on projects. And today, we'll look at examples of how such partnerships were brokered and structured, uh, what was successful, what were some of the lessons learned. And we hope that from our discussion during the next hour or so, yeah, you'll walk away with some actionable insights for your own efforts. And again, I'm super honored to introduce our three wonderful panelists who will share their stories with us. And I'll introduce all three of them now, and then I'll stop droning on. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, first up is Linda Kim. Linda is the inaugural executive director of Corporate Social Responsibility for One Legal, leading the legal tech firm's philanthropic and community engagement. Prior to this role, Linda has held several nonprofit leadership roles as the Vice President of Client Services at Community Initiatives, Director of Pro Bono and External Affairs at Bay Area Legal Aid, and Deputy Director of One Justice. She began her legal career as a staff attorney at One Justice, focusing her advocacy on regulations that affect the capacity of California nonprofit legal organizations to serve clients. She serves on the board of directors for California Bar Affinity, and Linda has lobbied the UN Commission on the Status of Women, developed legal advocacy projects in Cambodia and Indonesia, and worked as a translator with the Central American Human Rights Commission. Wow, Linda, hi, and welcome. Hi, Linda. And hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Linda will be followed by Grace Gilligan. Uh, Grace is an attorney in the Government Investigations and Regulatory Enforcement Group in the legal department of J.P. Morgan Chase and a member of the department's pro bono steering committee. Prior to joining J.P. Morgan, Grace was a litigation associate at Millbank, and during her time there, Grace worked on two pro bono externships with the Juvenile Rights Division of the Legal Aid Society. Grace is a graduate of Fordham Law, and Grace was also the recipient of the 2019 J.P. Morgan Chase Pro Bono Fellowship, and she'll talk more about that later in the program. Hi, Grace. Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me on the panel. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's my pleasure. It's a huge honor. And uh, batting cleanup is uh, Jeannie Ortiz Ortiz. Jeannie is an attorney from Puerto Rico and Pro Bono Net's Disaster Response Legal Fellow. At Pro Bono Net, Jeannie works to foster collaboration between legal professionals involved in disaster recovery 
and to develop technology and self-help resources for disaster survivors. And before joining Pro Bono.net, Jeannie provided free legal representation on behalf of low-income LGBT individuals in Puerto Rico and worked as a legal fellow at the Central Alabama Fair Housing Center. Uh, Jeannie was recently appointed to the American Bar Association's Disaster Legal Services Program, where she will help to coordinate legal help disaster survivors uh, to legal help uh, to disaster survivors here in the U.S. Hi, Jeannie. Hey, Tim, and hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, now, that's a mouthful, and, and it's because our, our, our various team guests do so much in the community. Uh, we'll, kick, we'll kick it off with Linda, but before she comes on, I have to say how fun it was planning the session, Linda, from, from airport lounges, other far-flung locations. I mean, fun is not a word one often uses for webinar session planning. But that's Linda and our panelists in a nutshell. So thank you all so much for this. And uh, let's, just, let's get the show on the road. Uh, Linda, can you tell us about One Legal and its philanthropic arm, which you lead? And you have a unique story. Could you tell us a little bit, a little bit about your journey to get to that role? No. Just, <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> so, <laughs> One Legal is in the business of making litigation support simpler. I mean, we have a growing suite of products and services that help lawyers build efficiencies in their practice and access court systems. Um, and I was brought on because the company has always been generous and always gave when asked, but never had a strategic framework, so everything was very ad hoc. We gave to legal aid, but we also gave to community softball teams, arts programs, civic education, elementary schools. And we lack that sustainable focus that's necessary if you want philanthropy to be a legacy within the company. So my challenge was to look at our core business and determine how we can align a corporate citizenship program with our core. And that's the key to building a sustainable program, like I just said. And one of the first things that we did when I came on board was to change our giving back program. <clears throat> Um, because giving back inherently, those words mean that it's about us and what we're doing, and we should not be the focus. Our customers, and in this case, our nonprofits, they are the focus. And through a series of informal interviews with legal aid lawyers, we came up with our, um, our current community partnership program. And the, the program puts our nonprofit partners on equal footing with us. Our partners are expected to engage so that we can better help you help your clients. It like the sh the nugget of this is I want people I want our nonprofit partners to be thanking me less and working with me more. Does that make sense? Absolutely, Linda. One of the things during our, our <laughs> webinar prep we talked about was the one percent pledge that your company took, and I think it's a meaningful framing of this conversation and of your efforts. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I can. The Pledge 1% movement is so awesome, and I'm, I'm, like, I'm incredibly proud that we've made this commitment. Pledge 1% was started by Salesforce and a handful of other tech companies a number of years ago. Through the pledge, each of us, um, each of the, the companies that takes this pledge, we commit to at least one of the four pillars. And the four pillars are time, product, profit, and equity. So it's it's a real commitment that you're building into the DNA of the company. It helps future-proof you against what happens when revenues are down. Um, it, it's making the real commitment versus saying, like, we're, our philanthropy is the nice to have when everything is, is good, and then if something bad happens, then we're just going to get rid of it. So what One Legal is doing is we're formally staking our commitment to giving to legal nonprofits. And we've chosen um, to pledge in three areas, profit, time, and product, meaning we are pledging to move toward giving away 1% of our pr profits, 1% um, of our overall time, and um, our products to um, the nonprofits that, that we work with. Is, you know, is, this, is this something that is uh, more and more companies are adopting, or is this relatively new? How long has this been around? You know, I th it's been around for um, at least a few years. But more and more companies are adopting it. 
if you go to pledge1percent.org, um, you can see a whole list of all of the, the companies. It, it started with tech companies, but it's, it's branched far beyond that. Wow. And I believe, in fact, there are some um, big law um, firms that are also listed there. Okay. Okay. Um, so, Ian, you know, by the way, a, a, a slide deck will not be complete without at least one one uh, picture. <laughs> and um, how, in amid this entire like, world of nonprofits, so many doing really good work. Aside from pouncing like this cat, um, how, how do you how do you know which to approach to work with? Well, so stepping back from who to, I would say okay. So in order to be sustainable, mm. any company's giving needs to be aligned with the core business of that company. So our our company creates litigation tools. So legal aid is naturally a great fit. And I was a legal aid lawyer for 15 years in, in both the direct services and support center. Um, so I have the luxury of being connected to the 100 plus legal aids in California, as well as to, the pro to programs in all states. And because of those relationships, um, we're, able to, we're able to very easily uh, give, give away more. I can spend less time finding legal aid nonprofits that, that might fit what we need and more time building a program that's meaningful to to our partners and and actually helpful rather than this um, rather than a hindrance you know we've here's an example when los angeles superior, superior court which is the largest court system in the nation when they launched e-filing um, i knew we had an opportunity to provide a real benefit to legal aid programs but we had a really short time to do it and i needed to be able to do it at scale and fast so I called Sylvia Argetta of Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, and LAFLA is an example of like of the true collaborative partner that you, that you want when you're trying to figure out how do we reach as many um, people as possible. They didn't accept my offer of free e-filing, and then pull up the ladder behind them and say, "Well, we're all set, so um, everyone else can go fend for themselves." Sylvia understood that mandatory e-filing would have a profound effect on legal nonprofits in Los Angeles and therefore on the clients that they serve and that, that other nonprofits serve. So LAFLA helped me reach all the LA programs um, with an offer of help. They hosted MCLEs to get legal aid attorneys from all programs prepped and ready for e-filing. They helped us answer questions and make sure that, that when e-filing launched in LA, we were we and the courts were all thinking about, well, how does this affect indigent filers? How does this affect low-income Californians? Um, and I, I so appreciate LAFLA's partnership because their instinct wasn't to help themselves and just be done with it. Mm -hmm. It was to ask, how can we be of service for the greater good? Well, and so that leads to the next question. And, you know, over the years here at Pro Bono Net, we've worked uh, with a range of nonprofit organizations and for-profit companies. And uh, of course, as everyone on this call can probably relate to, each has its own culture and unique way of navigating. Um, in, in your travels, you've worked with net many nonprofits on both sides of the fence, right? As a leader of a nonprofit organization and as someone going into nonprofits to see how you can work with them. What, what are some takeaways for this audience of what makes a good nonprofit partner? Well, first and foremost, you have to be able to step away from what your immediate need is, what your organization's need or your firm's need is, and ask how you can be of service. The foundational starting point for any collaborative project is understanding how each player is approaching the opportunity, to be able to ask how can we help the project be the most in fact impactful, and it's actually the same question on both sides. Um, I would also say to have the open conversations and willingness to build trust and respect. You know, just remember what your mama told you, like, just be kind and, um, and understand that we all have a role to play and different responsibilities um, and stakeholders based on that role. My stakeholders may be different from the nonprofit stakeholders and that, that my role and that of any CSR or firm side pro bono partner these roles exist within a larger corporate context. 
so please don't be adversarial. <laughs> Fortunately, for um, with most of the nonprofits I've engaged with, um, they've all been collaborative and thoughtful. But it, but if you have come at me with some demands that that startled me. Um, and I know that legal aid lawyers are fierce. They're fierce advocates. They're used to advocating against an oppressive system. So I will give a lot of grace to those who come at, at me instead of talking with me. Um, but I promise you that if you do that to someone to, in, um, in corporate CSR or a law firm pro bono um, who hasn't been a legal, legal aid lawyer, they're going to be much less forgiving. Um, and it's not just your reputation you burn. You harm all of legal aid because the the reaction can be like, well, this is just a group that's difficult to work with, so we don't want to give to them. So mm. please don't treat us like opposing counsel that you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, a really, that's a really, really good takeaway for, I mean, for just working together, period, right? With, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, just remember what your mama told you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so we do have, I'm looking at the time, and we do have some time for uh, for a couple of questions, if anyone has uh, a question, and just remember that before we move on to Grace um, and to talk about her program, uh, we are going to pause between each of these uh, presentations for a question or two, and then at the end we'll leave some time for some additional questions. So uh, let me check the questions widget just to see if we have any questions, and it doesn't look as though we do. Uh, Excellent. So, I've bored everyone. <laughs> that you've covered it so comprehensively that no one has. <laughs> I love your framing. Uh, uh, well, thank you so much, Linda. That was really helpful. And, um, and we'll move on to, uh, to Jeannie. You know, uh, thank I mean, you all. Sure. Thanks, great. Uh, th thanks, um, uh, Linda. A couple of days ago, uh, Law360 published an article that was called uh, How Corporate America Can Help to Close the Justice Gap. I don't know if anyone saw that. But uh, the article had a lot of uh, conversation. It had some conversation and some quote quotes with uh, corporate, legal, nonprofit sectors. And uh, they had a, a, a pretty uh, interesting quote quote which cap captures what uh, some of what we're saying. And here it is. Um, it says, for a corporation, a corporation can develop low-cost techno technological innovations that can be used for improvising, uh, improving justice, facilitate the logistics of how like-minded organizations and individuals pursue their goals, or allow its armies of lawyers to focus on pro bono work. And, and this is a really good intro to Grace Gilligan, who moved the slides. Um, who has been embedded here at Pro Bono Net for the past six months as the J.P. Morgan Chase Pro Bono Fellow? And Grace, uh, I, I love this this quote that the highlighted part of the quote um, that you um, that you have here, and it says, "I truly believe the legal profession can use technology to make the world a better place." Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure, yeah. Thank you, Tim. Um, so first of all, I just want to say briefly that um, the views that I expressed here today on the webinar are my own and not uh, necessarily the views of, of J.P. Morgan Chase, the, the standard disclaimer. Um, sure, happy to expand on the quote. So, um, you know, I think people have always been cynical about lawyers. That's something that you come to realize um, as a lawyer. Um, and we also live in a time of really intense cynicism about technology um, and its effects on privacy and democracy and even the, the social fabric. Um, and I think that that cynicism, that like deep level of cynicism, isn't without reason um, because technology certainly has been used in malevolent ways. But, you know, I have this abiding faith that technology can still be a force for good because I view technology as an amplifier of all human capabilities, both good and bad. And I think that we can confront that truth not by abandoning technology altogether, 
um, but by figuring out how to use it in more creative and benevolent ways. Um, and it's really through, it's been through my legal pro bono work um, that, that really drives my, my optimistic viewpoint um, because it was through my pro bono clients that I realized the power that I have as just one person with a law degree um, to change the, the trajectory of other people's lives for the better. And I think I can amplify um, that mission using technology. So, you know, I'm just, you know, deeply grateful to both uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and to Pro Bono Net uh, for giving me that, the opportunity to, to do that through the Pro Bono Fellowship. And we are grateful to both, Grace. Um, and, you know, before we go into uh, how you chose the project, uh, could you talk a little bit more about, um, or a little bit, we haven't really covered the, the fellowship on what it's all about at J.P. Morgan. Sure, sure. So the, the J.P. Morgan Chase uh, Legal Pro Bono Fellowship is an annual award that the J.P. Morgan Chase Legal Department gives to one of its in-house attorneys um, each year um, to pursue a project that advances the three pillars of the legal department's pro bono mission. Um, and those three pillars are strengthening communities, empowering families, and advocating for vulnerable individuals. It's a really unique opportunity that reflects the legal department's commitment to pro bono and also its, its faith and its attorneys to go out and, and do some good in the world. And I was lucky enough to be the 2019 recipient of the fellowship. Oh, well, congrats for that. And from the vast range of possibilities for projects that you could choose from to spend six months as a J.P. Morgan F Chase Fellow, how did you go about choosing this particular project? Yeah, so, you know, I was thinking, I had been thinking for a long time about in-house pro bono work. I spent um, eight years at a large law firm before going in-house, and now I've been an in-house attorney at J.P. Morgan for seven years. So I've had a good chunk of time in, in each um, sector of, of the profession. Um, and I, I noticed when I came in-house that for structural reasons, um, you know, just the way that a legal department is structured as opposed to the way a law firm is structured, in-house attorneys generally don't have the same tools um, as law firm attorneys to facilitate long-term pro bono projects. Um, tools like full-time pro bono coordinators that, that the big law firms have, 24-hour legal support staff. I mean, these are things really in place at large law firms that, you know, aren't, aren't the same in an in-house legal department. So as a result, you know, I, I came to believe that there is a, a vast and underutilized pool of in-house legal talent that could be harnessed in the profession, the legal profession's effort to close the access to justice gap. And so the the big, you know, as I started thinking about applying for the fellowship, I decided that the big picture goal of any project I would do would be to find new ways for in-house attorneys like me to participate um, more effectively in pro bono work. And I chose to partner with Pro Bono Net on the project um, because I, I thought we could use technology in the service of that goal uh, and because the organization really shares my deep commitment to using the, the power of technology for social good. The name of the project that you and uh, the team conceived and worked on for six months is called Pro Bono Bridge. And I know that it's not out in the wild uh, yet. It's something that's still under construction and um, development. And but could you give us just a really brief overview of what that is? Yeah, yeah, it is still at a very early, early prototype stage. Um, but Pro Bono Bridge um, would be a social media platform 
for attorneys in different sectors of the profession to connect and collaborate on pro bono projects um, and to, to use one another's different types of resources to help one another get, um, get more pro bono done. So the different sectors being in-house attorneys like me, um, law firm attorneys, regardless of the size of the law firm, you know, big New York law firms and also smaller firms, solo practitioners, um, and then legal services attorneys who need help um, from pro bono lawyers with their, with their cases and matters. Um, so the idea would be to create a, a technological bridge between these different sectors of the profession who have different resources and different gaps to fill, you know, all in the service of getting more pro bono work done. So well, I heard a lot about J.P. Morgan Chase's Force for Good team. And I should say, full disclosure, Grace and I sat next to each other for six months. <laughs> and yeah. Grace, I, I'll miss you terribly. Um, but what is the Force for Good uh, team and their role in your fellowship project? They're, obviously, you're collaborating across a, a bunch of different uh, uh, teams and uh, organizations. What was the Force for Good team? What is that? And what was that like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Force for Good team is a team within the J.P. Morgan Chase corporate technology department. Um, and what they do is, and they build teams of, of technologists and designers and other, other specialists who work in corporate technology, and they help um, build, those teams help build technology for nonprofit organizations like Pro Bono Net. Um, and they work on a number of projects each year for different organizations. There is an application project, uh, application process rather for each project that they take on. Uh, so when I received the fellowship, you know, um, and you know, it was going to revolve around technology. Folks within J.P. Morgan suggested that uh, Pro Bono Net and I apply for uh, a Force for Good project to help us build Pro Bono Bridge. Um, and so that's, that's what we did. And so we had a team of technologists and other specialists um, within J.P. Morgan Chase Corporate Technology, you know, helping us build the system on a day-to-day on a -day basis. So it was, um, it was that force for good team really building the prototype and they're still working on building the prototype. That's pretty awesome to have that embedded on a, uh, an access to that kind of expertise. Now, for our community uh, that's listening right now, uh, in terms of takeaway, uh, can you give us some insight into how the partnership between you and uh, Pro Bono Net, it could be any organization, right, and the force for good team, and maybe any other collaborators you've met, you may have engaged, um, how did that work? Yeah, I mean, I, I was in a really unique position. Um, where, you know, I have, I was able for six months to really have a foot in each place. Um, so I'm still, during the course of the fellowship, I've still been an employee of Grace Morgan Chase, um, and you're able to work with the, the Force for Good team within J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, and at the same time, I was embedded within Pro Bono Net. You know, I was going to, physically going to the Pro Bono Net office each day to work on the project. So... It was a really unique um, situation um, to, to have a foot in, in the door of each place and to be able to understand perspectives from two very different teams. You know, I had a, a team of people at Pro Bono Net um, helping, me, helping me with the project and you know, vetting, vetting the different versions of the prototype and making suggestions. Um, and then I had the, the Force for Good technologist, you know, actually building the prototype and lending their technological expertise. And I got to be sort of in the, in the center of that. Um, and, you know, I think, just personally speaking, I think just having, having the different perspectives and being, you know, really embedded at, at Pro Bono Net was helpful, was helpful and, and unique for my project. 
So we have a couple of questions coming in, and uh, we have time for at least one before we move on to our third and final section of the program. And here it is. Uh, when it, you were thinking about structuring partnerships, how big, and this could be for, uh, for both you, Grace, and, and, and Linda, uh, how big is the focus on sustainability? Or are they generally limited scope projects? Well, for Pro Bono Bridge, I think that you know sustainability is an important discussion. But I'm I'm not quite there yet with Pro Bono Bridge. We're you know we're finishing up hopefully the prototype in the next month or so, and then I'll move into a, a testing phase. So I think that. You know, the sustainability question for me, although it's been in the back of my mind as we're building the project, um, you know, who will who will own it? Um, you know, I think a, the hurdle that we have to get over before the sustainability hurdle is really whether people will be interested in using the tool. Um, so I'm not, although, you know, I think that you should have the question of sustainability in your mind from the outset. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm still at an earlier stage of will this work and will people want to use it? And then I'll, I'll deal with sustainability. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's great. I mean, that's a, and I really love this question because uh, I'm a little bit obsessed, uh, maybe too obsessed with the whole idea about sustainability because there's so many great programs that get started and uh, we get funding for it. Uh, and, you know, organizations around the country get funding uh, different sources, and then uh, they, they serve the population, but then, you know, towards the end of that grant period, it's how do you sustain that beyond, and how do you uh, market that to the community that you want to serve, and then continue to iterate and develop that pro project. Uh, so thanks for that question, and, and, and great answer, uh, Grace. Um, all right, I think we'll move on to our final uh, part of this program. And again, we'll leave some space at the end for questions about that and for questions about anything that you've heard here. Um, and uh, so I'll turn it over to Jeannie. I'm not going to do, I introduced Jeannie in the beginning, and she just has uh, a, a pretty uh, awesome presentation about the collaboration between uh, for-profit, non-profit, how to get the word out there, how to let the community know uh, that there is, uh, there, there is help for those in need. Um, sometimes, as we, all, or we can all relate, um, so much of the people that we aim to help don't even know that they have a legal problem, or if they know they have a legal problem, they don't know where to find a trusted source for that problem. So, uh, Jeannie, take it away. Thanks, Tim. Um, a great introduction and context for that. And uh, Linda and Grace, it was here. It was, it was great to, to hear your stories. Uh, so, uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share some insights from our work on a special disaster relief project that ProBinoNet has been working on with Dink Suages Network. They're a global communications company. And we kicked off this campaign several months after the, the, the 2017 major natural disasters, Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, Maria, and the California wildfires. Uh, so Dentsu was looking to expand their corporate social responsibility strategies and program. And they were particularly interested in supporting uh, justice efforts because of the Legal Services Corporation's uh, justice gap report that was uh, published uh, during that year as well. So we partnered with them last year uh, when the conversation around natural disasters was still a hot topic. Uh, and then especially after other major disasters hit the U.S. like Hurricanes Florence and, um, and Hurricane Michael. And let me quickly set the stage for this if you can go to the next slide. Most of the civil legal issues that people face in the wake of disasters uh, are really a magnification of legal problems low and medium income families may already be facing. Uh, so in a lot of cases, the disaster just uh, make 
makes the problems um, the problem worse, uh, especially when it comes to housing or family law. And when it comes to securing financial assistance from federal state programs because of the damage caused by the disaster, there are many time-sensitive matters. And as you can see on the screen, uh, these issues can extend to several years after the emergency. So in, tw in 2017 and in 2018, uh, we were seeing a lot of these issues emerge uh, in Florida and Puerto Rico, Texas, California, North Carolina, and many other areas in the U.S. Uh, and especially after these disasters, uh, there were a lot of reports and studies, articles, interviews, stories about the, the devastating and, and the disproportionate impact that major disasters have and continue to have on low-income and low-wealth uh, communities. So taking all of this into consideration, I think uh, Dengsu's interest in developing a campaign to support this and also our interest uh, was very timely. And this did not just happen uh, overnight, this collaboration. Uh, there are many groups involved in disaster legal aid, both at the local and national level. Uh, we've, Pro Bono Net, we've been involved in disaster relief uh, since the 9-11 attacks, uh, then used many of the strategies to uh, support response efforts after Hurricane Katrina and Superstorm Sandy and uh, following disasters. So, it's been years of engaging with stakeholders and, and special disaster relief initiatives and building those relationship, uh, relationships over the years to strengthen uh, preparedness, response, and recovery work. So when Dan Su Aegis approached the American Bar Association to express interest in supporting disaster relief through their marketing resources, uh, the American Bar Association invited us to be a part of that conversation due, due to our presence and, and support in this space. And this is the project in a nutshell. Uh, we participated in an idea jam here in New York to lay out the outreach challenges and disaster legal aid and brainstorm about ways we could use marketing support to expand resources for both attorneys and survivors. Then we worked with two agencies from the Dane Suages Network to create and develop a message for a two-part campaign targeted to the legal community and to people affected by disasters. And then the next slide, yes, thank you. Uh, and so this is a screenshot of the first video we created with them, which targeted legal professionals. And uh, what, what did that process look like? Uh, we, we essentially provided additional context on the work that we do and the work our legal aid partners do to help disaster survivors. Uh, that involved several conversations and around how preparedness is critical to provide an effective, organized, and meaningful legal response. Uh, there's often a surge of lawyers who want to help after a disaster, and the challenge from our perspective is connecting them to the resources that are most helpful uh, and also to legal service providers uh, who are looking for additional help uh, from pro bono attorneys. And attorneys we've talked to about this have cited not feeling confident enough to take on disaster-related cases because of lack of experience and knowledge. Uh, so a key part of the campaign was telling legal professionals, hey, you have the skills and, and we have the resources and we have the connections, so let's do this together. Uh, we'll provide you with a, with a set of resources and a place to start so that we can make good use of, of your advocacy skills and your interest in helping out. And an extra layer of that messaging uh, was that just like with many other, many other areas of the law, uh, training is important and knowing about the most recent changes to FEMA procedures or state law is also important. Uh, so what are some of the things that worked um, and what are some of the things that we've learned uh, throughout this process? Uh, so a big takeaway uh, from this campaign was balancing everyone's goals and timeline for the project uh, and leveraging each side's uh, knowledge and assets. So Dane Sue came from a place of getting right to the point, which I think they've done a wonderful job with uh, because we only have people's attention for the first five seconds or so when it comes to videos or ads. And then we came from a place of making sure we are be being sensitive to people's situation after a disaster, being mindful of all the details and differences when it comes to legal response, how things vary from state to state, etc. Uh, an example, um, another example is, is that they wanted to get data and set up metrics from the very beginning and start to track the progress of the project. And that was really important for them. And it was important for us too, um, but we also wanted to make sure that we were on the same page when it came to messaging and getting our partners feedback. That was also important.
So finding the right balance between what we both wanted from the project and what our priorities were uh, was very important. I think it was one of the things that worked really well because of everyone's engagement and commitment to the project. And especially with the timeline, oh, you can um, you can go to the previous slide. Uh, uh, and especially with the timeline in mind, uh, one of the things I think uh, is worth pointing out uh, is, is, is this. Um, this, this was possible in many ways because ProBonoNet had the bandwidth and capacity to work on this specific project. Uh, and even though Dentsu did all of this in kind, having several staff at ProBonoNet uh, working on this was necessary, um, in my opinion. Uh, we needed to work with them to develop a message, to develop special landing pages, to work with our partners on getting their feedback for the campaign, and also to work with both our communications teams uh, to publish press releases and manage social media and the launch. And now you can, yes. And then the traditional uh, best practice, uh, several of the agencies and partners wanted to contribute to this campaign. So I remember that at one point there were like 15 of us in a conference call. So things like making sure we got the right edits in place, maybe they get to some of the people who would find that helpful for context. Uh, for example, um, or another example, uh, talking about the difference between legal help information and legal aid and how uh, consistency with that language is important for, for all of the creative assets. That was important too. And on their side, um, explaining to us that we needed to limit words for the video because of the time or that several people needed to review one change to incorporate it. We're planning who is going to moderate the variety or, and multiple comments we received from one social media post that, would ad, that was advertised through Facebook and if we were all on the same page to, um, to agree on one approach uh, to manage that. And there were uh, two main ways we managed that communication, and they are very simple, but I think uh, they're effective. Uh, one was uh, scheduling biweekly, 30-minute uh, calls to check in with each other, go over questions, and provide updates. And then the second one was having point um, persons on each side who can communicate with the rest of the teams uh, of what's, go what's going on in between those check-in calls. So I was ProBonoNet's uh, contact per person for everything related to the project, and then they had two other people as contact, um, uh, specific people uh, working on the project. Uh, and then I think fle flexibility was also important um, because when we needed to clarify something that we couldn't do over email, um, both organizations were pretty flexible to jump on a call and talk it over. And finally, um, throughout this work and process, uh, we found that it's been great for continuing that engagement with our disaster relief partners and have them weigh in on the messaging. Uh, we also wanted to be mindful of the value of their perspective and input. Uh, for example, uh, Voices for Civil Justice featured the, the video campaign, uh, the one that you saw the screenshot um, earlier. Um, they, they featured the, the campaign on, on their All Rise for Civil Justice website and promoted it also through their newsletter and listserv. And with social media, it was easy for other partners to retweet or share the video or ads um, related to the campaign. So we, we made sure to collaborate with all of the stakeholders involved, including Dentsu as a for-profit company, make sure that everyone was connected and we were synced for, for the launch. And then if you can, if the last slide is just uh, a link to the video. Uh, that was the first video that we launched. We're still working on the second one, but um, you, I mean, you can feel free to, to play it on Vimeo and let us know what you think. Thank you, Jeannie. Jeannie, you know what? I, I have the video ready to go. So it's only about 30 seconds and uh, just an opportunity to see what collaboration between Dentsu, who is a multinational global behemoth um, in the marketing and public relations space, uh, partnering with, uh, through a relationship with the ABA, or at least going to the ABA, and then bringing another organization like PBN, like ProBonanet, or whichever organization in, and how that works together. So there is, you know, I'm gonna show the clip of the video now. It's 30 seconds, but what I'd love, um, when we come back from that, and maybe you could think about the, our three panelists, what, are, what is one big takeaway uh, that we can offer to the uh, to the audience for uh, collaborating, reaching out, and working together 
across sectors, right? So let's let's see if uh, let's see if this works. Uh, the guy there. Declared an emergency. Waiting for FEMA aid. It can take just a few hours to help people affected by a natural disaster. But when they need legal advice, it takes someone who spent 1,400 hours in class, 1,600 hours in a library, 1,000 hours of late nights, and 400 hours of bar prep to become a legal expert. Communities in need are counting on your skills. Register to volunteer today. When they need us, we'll be ready together. And that's it. <laughs> um, and, I, and I also wanted to, to say something about the sustainability part because I think that was a good question. Um, for, for this campaign, we definitely saw the opportunity. Um, Sorry about that. Hold on. Oh. You can get that your own or not. But what happens when it's a civil issue? Okay. okay great. That <laughs> yeah, so for this for this particular project, um, we, we saw the opportunity for ongoing branding um, and, and support for disaster relief efforts. And so we made sure that we didn't make reference to dates for specific disasters so that it could be something that we could reshare in the future uh, when appropriate and, and when relevant. Uh, so for, for at least for, for the videos um, part, that was an important sustainability consideration that we talked about. Excellent. Let me check to see if we have any questions. And that was an example of why autoplay on videos is never a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so here is a question that we have, and this could go to all of the panelists. Uh, um, in a, so I'm going to come back to the, the one big question, or maybe you could answer that um, uh, as you see um, as, as time permits. Uh, for all the panel, how important is executive leadership buy-in to private-public partnerships? For instance, have you been in a position where you've had to earn that buy-in? And if so, how did how do you go about doing it? I'll take that one. This okay. is Linda. Um, so before I made the the sector switch from nonprofit into um, into uh, corporate legal tech, I, um, I did a lot of research about CSR and different programs in, um, in industries, like in every industry possible. And I uncovered there were five elements of impactful CSR, and the top one was active leadership engagement, that, um, that you have true you have true buy-in from the very top. And I report directly to the CEO, and that makes a huge difference in what I'm able to do. that yep no yep. um, that's great thank you thank you <laughs> and um, okay so as a final round uh, of, of, of questions so what is the if there's this one big takeaway from each of you about uh, that our community of nonprofits and for-profits hybrid corporations can take to um, about working together about getting those um, those collaborations going um, and how to work together when you once you do have them. Um, uh, Grace, you want to start with you? I'm putting you on the um, spot. Sure, <laughs> sure. I mean, I just I think um, keeping an open mind about um, the perspective and the you know the ability of different different sectors to participate. Um, in these types of projects, I think a lot of a lot of for-profit corporations um, have these different groups embedded in them um, that I think a lot of people don't realize even exist. Um, so searching for those groups and and trying to connect with them, you know, I think is is a is a great and, and worthwhile idea. I mean, I. I've been at JP Morgan Chase for seven years, and I didn't even know that, um, you know, doing doing pro bono work within the legal department, and I didn't even know that the Force for Good team existed in the corporate technology department um, before someone told me about it, um, you know, and suggested that they may be helpful with my project. So I think, you know, certainly if you're within a large corporation to, to look for those groups that, um, 
that do different different kinds of pro bono work, legal and otherwise. And then also if you're if you're outside or if you're not at a for profit organization to, to try to seek them out from the outside. I mean, I, I just think that there are so many similar things um, at, at many corporations that can that can collaborate and help nonprofits. You know, I think it's it's worth the time to seek them out. Yeah. Jeannie? Sure. Um, I would say that, you know, a, a first part is determining if, if this is a project uh, that aligns with your organization's values and a project that you can take on. Uh, and if that's a yes, uh, committing to that and, and being responsive and, and being reliable and, and flexible with, with the people that you're working with. I, I found that that was extremely helpful for the work that, that we've been doing with Thanks to Aegis. Uh, also acknowledging all of uh, everyone's work in the project because um, when it comes to in-kind contributions, um, there's a lot to recognize and give credit for. And uh, also knowing that it's, it's, it's going to be a win-win because it from, from the nonprofit side, it really expands your reach to uh, your target community and uh, to, to help amplify the resources that you want to share. And, and from the prof for profit side, I would say uh, also an opportunity to expand their um, CSR strategies and, and to use their resources to, to support uh, justice efforts and foster a culture of social impact within their employees, which I know um, that is, is part of what Dane Sue also wanted to do through their pro bono program. And Linda. As in any relationship, communication is key. You have to be able to have a real conversation. And if you don't build that out from the start, when something tricky comes up later, it's going to be a whole lot harder. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I mean, we've done uh, several presentations. I've, I've, I've hosted panels and, and spoken on communication. It's so key. I agree. And that's a really a uh, great way to wrap this up, uh, communicating with effectively with your partners. I, this has been such an honor, such a privilege, and, and thank you so much, Jeannie and Grace and Linda, for taking the time out of your super busy schedules to, uh, to plan this webinar and to put it on. Um, very, very much appreciated. Yeah, thanks so much, Tim, for, uh, for organizing. Yes, yeah. thank you everyone. Thank you, the, Thanks the everyone. Wonderful. And thank, thank you, listeners. Very, okay. very good today. And, uh, thank you, sorry. Good wrap up, eh? Yeah. And please, um, everybody, our webinar schedule for the rest of the year is up at lsmtap.org slash events. It is in the chat. Um, we have several more webinars coming up, including three more this month, and they are all free. This webinar will be archived on YouTube within about a week here and posted to our website uh, with materials. Thank you all so much, and I hope to work with you on awesome projects like this again in the future. Thank you. Bye.